So I didn't really cover much of the wiring just because I sort of wanted to get it done. Uh, I wanted to get a push on because uh, today or tomorrow's actually will have been one month uh, since I started the assembly on this and I've just been working on it on the weekends or in evenings when I get a chance. But anyway, um, there's my wiring job. I think it came out pretty neat, pretty orderly. Uh, I'll fix up those ribbon cables, but uh, as you can see, everything came together quite nicely. Um, very organized. I got bundles. Now I do have my uh, stepper motor, the encoder cables, and the power cables. I didn't shorten them. I just left them in long lengths because, again, I haven't decided if I'm going to run an external box for all this stuff yet. I want to test it in the machine. If this works out okay, then fine, you know, it can stay there. I it just, I am a little bit concerned about possible vibration through the chassis um, over time, but we'll see. Uh, I also wired into the 12 volt uh, because I ordered one of those Chinese probes, uh, one of the ones that fits right in the spindle. I had assembled the touch probe, but then I just decided to order the other one that fits in the spindle anyway, so. Yeah, all it's left to do really is actually wire up the, the VFD and those cables and uh, we can fire this thing up and give it a test. So this junction box I got is an Amazon Prime deal and uh, I've modified it and put all my power supply, my VFD and all that sort of stuff inside this box and I've had the all the control stuff, the stepper motor drivers and everything that's mounted to the back of the, the DMC2 uh, as you see in the videos there. So I just wanted to walk through what I did to this box and how I laid it out. Uh, and eventually this would be hang, hanging on the wall or on the side of the cabinet here. It just depends where I decide to mount it, what's most convenient. So, so I'll show you what I did and what's inside. So here we go. So first off, I cut a hole in this end and I 3D printed um, this vent guard. And you probably can't see it there, but we'll see it when we look inside. I actually mounted a fan, a uh, 92 millimeter Noctua fan. Uh, because they're nice and quiet and reliable and uh, I just mounted that fan on the inside of the box and it's uh, pushing air out on this side I 3d printed another one of those uh, those guards and I just drilled a bunch of holes uh, in this side and then on the inside I put a, uh, a filter and I'll show you all that and another one of these on the inside but these are where all my power connections are I got aviation connectors I got two four pins, one six or seven pin, even though we only need six six wires, and then uh, another connector for my VFD, uh, the power. And the reason why each of those, this, that one there is a five pin, even though you only need a four pin. I got those, it's just because I got a better price on them. They were available. Uh, I just picked these all of these up off Amazon. Um, and it was a significant savings to just get a five pin instead of a four pin. There's no difference. It handles more than enough amps to be able to run this. The other thing I did is I put in a dedicated power switch and that one lights up when you put power on it. And then we got the cable gland for my power cable coming in. So here on the inside, that's just another one of those vent covers. And for a filter, I just cut up a green uh, scotch bright one of the cheap ones I don't think it's actually a scotch bright brand but one of those green scrubby pads and it just works as a coarse filter to keep you know any chips or particles out of the the box I found that that works quite well without having to buy dedicated filter media uh, and you still get good airflow so that's what I went with and then on the other side here you can see that I've got my Noctua fan mounted and again that's pushing air out so it's sucking in through the filter portion. Power is actually coming in and going in through my circuit breaker. 
Then I'm going to my power switch, which illuminates when it's turned on. Power switch goes into those DIN rail terminal blocks. Um, so that's just 100, 120 volt dedicated power coming in, and I have some extra taps there should I need them for some other gear. That's why I decided to go with DIN rail uh, terminal connector, connectors, so that I wasn't have to do, having to do a bunch of wire to wire junctions and multi wires inside of one, uh, one connector. Um, it's just much easier and neater and allows for expandability if you use uh, DIN rail terminal connectors. So from the DIN rail, 120 volt DIN rail, I have my 12 volt uh, DIN, DIN rail mounted power supply here. I went with this style because it was just easier, a uh, little bit more compact to fit in this box. This one is a 12 volt 10 amp, more than enough juice to, to run this. And it's not a Meanwell, it's an NVVV, which is sort of a, a copy, cheaper brand of the Meanwell power supplies, but seems to work quite well. Uh, I've tested it, I've done a bunch of cuts now with it. I had it on my bench there and hooked up to a bunch of stuff. Uh, this seems to work really well so far. Uh, hopefully it keeps on working well. It seems to run cool and puts out good power. So that's all we need. And it's a fraction of the price of the Meanwell. But again, with these cheaper brands, your mileage may vary. I'm sure that they're not very discerning into the components that go into these, so you could get a good one, you could get a bad one. Uh, from there, let's go over, this is my 36 volt power supply, and I just used the brackets that were included with it to mount it in here. I just bent them flat uh, and screwed that all down in there, and it's a fairly solid mount. If this was going to be subject to vibration, I would probably look at putting another sort of L bracket on there to brace it a little better, but um, as it works out now for the way that I'm going to have this positioned and mounted. Uh, it's so, more than solid enough there. Uh, from there I have my VFD and that's oriented uh, not only so that the wiring is easy and a little bit neater but also so that the fan will eject out towards my fan here that's also pulling air out. So it's all sort of air is all sort of moving in one direction. The fan from the 36 volt power supply that's sort of right here so that's directed out this way and can get sucked out and then airflow um, through the 12 volt, it's just passively cooled, so air is coming across, it goes right through here, and I have to say that this setup works really well. Everything stays nice and cool, nothing's heating up. So then from there, we go to two more DIN rail terminal blocks uh, for my 12 volt and my 36 volt, and then we go to, our a to my aviation connectors. Uh, I will note for you that uh, this aluminum here covering this this cable. I didn't have any shielded cable for the four pin for the VFD, so I just used individual wires of the appropriate gauge. And then for the ground wire, I used a bare piece of copper uh, and made sure that um, the shield made contact with that ground wire. This may not be necessary. I chose to add it. Um, I haven't had any issues, but I didn't try it without it. So I'm, I'm sure with a lot of these smaller VFDs, it's not as big a deal for those short runs. If you run into issues, you may want to consider doing something like that if you don't have the appropriate shielded cable. And just as an aside, people may not know, for bigger VFDs and more like, I guess, suppose more industrial applications, probably not applicable to the, the home hobby user, you normally have to use specific shielded cable um, for VFDs. It has uh, special tolerances and they have to be shielded in a specific way for them to actually work properly. So. I doubt that these are this sensitive, I've never had issues with them, but uh, just something interesting to note. So from there, having the aviation connectors uh, just allows me to connect and disconnect this power supply as needed, so I can either move the DMC2 or move the power supply, I can mount it in different locations for cleanup, for doing anything. It's just way easier to have that in a completely detachable box um, that is enclosed and dust proof, and with the filter on there. It seems to be doing a really good job of keeping uh, this clean inside, but still giving me good airflow and a way that I can house all of this without it just being splayed out all over the place or attached to a board hanging out in open air. Okay, so assembly is mostly complete. Just the final dialing in to do. So we're gonna power this thing on and see how it goes. Power this on. That's a good sign. And 
we'll get Mach 3 up and going. And it's unhappy. Perfect. CNC communication error. There we go. <laughs> a little bit of fooling, but that's the one thing with uh, the USB on the USB cable, at least anyway, on this thing is uh, so we have a functioning CNC. So I'm just going to home the machine now. And I also have it set up um, with soft limits, so when it hits, just before it hits the end switches, uh, it stops. So that way it avoids me having to go into the ports and pins and do an override and then change it back. So, set up and working. One other thing I will note, the only appropriate thing to do with the USB cable that comes with this unit, uh, if you install it and zip tie it like I did, is to cut it out and get yourself a better USB cable. This uh, USB B end, it does not fit into any of the USB ports on either of my laptops snugly. It never clips in, uh, and I would randomly lose connection when I first hooked it up. Very quick for me to find this. Uh, I had another USB cable that I used. So if you don't have a decent one, uh, it doesn't even have to be an expensive one, just one that clips in decently, uh, you may want to consider getting a brand that you trust um, or getting a couple different ones. Uh, good USB connection is paramount to the system working properly. When it comes to doing your software setup for uh, Mach 3, I would highly recommend going to the Discord server and uh, looking at the pin document that is there because that's going to be a much uh, better starting point for a lot of your settings. And all these are listed on there, but I just want to draw your attention to a couple things, and that is flipping one and two for your output for your spindle. And I set my PWM base frequency to 25. I found that that worked well. But like I say, these values are all in the document. Uh, I'm just sort of giving you a few changes that I made that I thought were beneficial. Uh, for your motor tuning, this is how I set mine up. And again, uh, my stepper drivers, I set them up for 1,600 steps. Um, so this is the setup that I'm running. I found 5,000 for the velocity was more than enough. The only one that's different is my Z-axis. The acceleration is turned down a little bit on that. I did want to make a note for spindle calibration because you'll probably find, as I did, that my spindle RPMs were different than what I was plugging into Mach 3. The easiest way I found to adjust this is to adjust your max speed. So if I were running at 18,000 RPMs, uh, the spindle would actually be turning at somewhere around, I think, 18,600 RPMs or so. Enough that I wanted to correct for it because it can throw off your cut settings quite a bit. So by turning the max speed up, um, now when I'm at 10,000 RPMs, 12,000 RPMs, I'm almost dead on RPM-wise. As I get up to 18,000, 20,000, it's off a little bit, but never more than, you know, maybe 100 RPMs. That is well within sec acceptable limits for anything that I'm doing. Uh, and you'll actually, f I found my spindle actually tops out, I think, at uh, 23,000 some odd RPMs anyway. So, um I found that this was the easiest way, rather than trying to go through a calibration and make a table. Um, that's, you know, a lot of work for nothing. It gets you close enough to do it this way. So that would be my recommendation, but, you know, you do what best suits your needs. So the other important thing I wanted to cover is motor home and soft limits. Um, you can set your G28 home location to whatever you want. That's what I'm using. Works well for me. 
soft limits are something that is very much overlooked in both of these documents, I think, because what you want your soft limits to be set for is that after the machine does its homing, um, you notice it backs off a little bit and then sets its zero point. Your soft limit should be set up so that after you home the machine, if you're jogging around, you can never hit your limit switches again. There's problems that a lot of people have had with this machine where if they do hit their home their limit switches, um, you have to go in and change your ports and pins to be able to back the machine off, um, you know, as an override, and then, you know, switch it back. If you set it up this way, you should never have to do that again. Um, these limits are within the limits that once you come up to it, it'll be just far enough off those limit switches, the machine will stop. Um, so this, I highly recommend doing this. It makes it way more usable, and you'll avoid any crashes uh, by doing this. So these would be my recommended settings. Thank you. 